In over 200 years of existence, the British Museum has witnessed many strange events. But none stranger than that which occurred at 4 p.m. on the 7th of February, 1845. A trustee wrote, My Lord Duke, it has accidentally fallen to be my duty to make your grace acquainted with a most lamentable occurrence which happened only a few minutes ago within our walls. I have this moment come from the room where the attendants are occupied in sweeping up the remnants of what was, less than an hour ago, one of the noblest monuments of this great national collection. thousand years of history lay in 200 pieces. Miraculously, by September 1845, the vase was re-exhibited, the work of a museum restorer, John Doubleday. Culmination of years of one man's artistry. The carving is often no thicker than a fraction of a millimeter. A single mistake The vase is surrounded by mysteries. When was it made? For whom? And why? And what techniques did the restorer use that after 140 years are beginning to break down? The vase is in a state of imminent collapse. Safe in the museum's laboratory in June 1988, the vase is in the care of Doubleday's modern successor. Nigel Williams, head of ceramics conservation, has the awesome task of breaking the vase deliberately. Even for this highly experienced department, the challenge is severe. To rebuild one of the world's priceless antiquities. How many problems will Nigel Williams face? Two very distinct. Getting it to pieces and then getting it back together again. Um, probably the more dangerous is getting it to pieces without damaging it any further. I mean, it's quite difficult to get something to come to pieces without creating more fragments than one started with. It mustn't collapse, it mustn't fall to pieces. It has to be taken to pieces in a controlled manner, piece by piece, individually, gently. Handling the vase looks deceptively easy, but few would want such a responsibility. Yeah, could you come away? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's not it's great. The latest techniques of ultraviolet photography reveal the horrors of the original destruction and the object's present perilous condition. Okay, do you want me to wash this here for a minute? Excellent. It shows me quite clearly the damage to the vase on the surface. But what it doesn't show me is really the hairline cracks. Therefore, it was necessary to take it to a longer exposure. The darker areas here are the missing pieces. These lighter areas are very probably where the ultraviolet light is penetrating through the crack, indicating that the adhesive is not holding onto the glass anymore. Here is the apex of the hit that broke the vase and the darker area up here is some wax infill put in in 1948. Because there's no white on the top of this rim it's very difficult to see where the breaks are. This photograph shows us exactly where they are um, and using this I shall be able to make a plan of the whole of the damage on the vase. Not just the damage, but a precise record of everything before a second moment of destruction. 200 fragments, over a thousand edges to trace in their exact position, and a record of where glass is missing after the sweeping up in 1845 and the gluing and waxing of the 1940s. 
Unlike today, no records were kept. No one knows precisely what was done, yet. Understanding that is as crucial as understanding the vase itself. Its story begins here, the Imperial Forum of Rome, its first home on the Capitoline Hill. Too fragile to travel, it was absent from a recent exhibition there of the glass of the Caesars. We could teach the Romans little or nothing about glass. One technique in particular was a speciality of the Romans, cameo glass. The art of carving two coloured layers of glass in direct imitation of cameo cutting in stone. Fashionable for only a brief period of history. Two scholars, David Whitehouse and Kenneth Painter, prime movers of the exhibition, have studied this and the Portland vase in particular. How does the vase relate to this, its only parallel, the Naples vase? Precisely dated from its burial in the ashes of Pompeii in 79 AD. Its carving suggests an earlier date for the more accomplished style of the Portland. The golden age of Augustus, around 30 BC. What is certain is that had it belonged to Augustus, the founder of the empire, it didn't accompany him here the Augusteum, burial place of all the early Caesars. It remained an imperial treasure. The vase breaks into recorded history in the 16th century, with the opening of this obscure imperial burial mound, the Monte del Grano. In 1582, the owner of the Monte del Grano, a speculator in antiquities, broke into the tomb through a shaft in the roof. In an upper chamber, he found a massive stone sarcophagus containing ashes. But were they in a vase? The sarcophagus was lowered to the floor and it and the ashes carried off to Rome, but there was no immediate mention of the vase. The purchaser of the sarcophagus was the city council of Rome, who placed it on public display on the Capitol in 1590, where it still remains. When the vase appeared in Rome shortly afterwards in the possession of a papal prince, it was immediately assumed to have come from the sarcophagus, that of the emperor Alexander Severus, murdered in 235 AD. This tomb was made for Alexander, but was the vase. It was thought so until the 19th century, when discoveries at Pompeii began to put a definite date to the making of cameo glass, the period of Augustus, 250 years earlier. Called the Barberini vase after its new owners, it began a new life. Sold to pay gambling debts, copied by a Scottish art dealer and possible spy, it passed to the English ambassador in Naples, Sir William Hamilton, and thence to England. The price had been too high, he couldn't afford the interest, and it was sold on to a private museum. It now began a very public career. Copied by Josiah Wedgwood, it became a familiar image in English society, under yet another name. That illustrious new owner, the Prime Minister, the third Duke of Portland. But the responsibility, not the price, was too great even for him. In 1810 it passed to the safety of the British Museum. Safe until 1845, when it met a drunken theology student wielding a nearby exhibit. Thank you. I think I'll have a, a big, long paper now. Okay, can you wait it for me? In July 1988, the vase 
France begins its return to its state of February 1845. But it's away. The plan is to coat it inside and out with a thin layer of papier mache, supported inside with plaster of Paris to add rigidity. The paper will act as a blotter to soak up the solvents which will break down the old glue. You can keep those just coming. That, at least, was the plan. This was to be the first strengthening practice, so that we could dismantle it. But what's happened is that the water we used to form these moulds has begun to react to the And the adhesive that was used to put it together has softened, and the vase is moving around. It's really moving around. You can see are much more prominent than they were when we started and I am very worried <laughs> very worried indeed the unknown nature of the old glues now adds a new urgency every brush stroke every drop of water adds to the risk of imminent collapse can you just put your hand on, on the vase I'm going to push it pretty pressure on it that way, I don't want to shoot it across the room. When I was told that this had been restored with an epoxy resin, is not true. No epoxy resin would act like this. If that's the case, and it's not an epoxy resin, one might come to the conclusion also that it's one of the standard adhesives used during that period. And that would be Shellac. Shellac is a, an excretion made by a beetle. Everyone used it around this period. In many cases, they used glue made from boiled up bones. That's why the thing is moving around. The plaster of Paris must go on immediately to prevent fragments falling inwards and to give the vase support. Just turn it round. The plaster is both wet and when drying exerts pressure. Two things the vase hates most. Good. If I, can you hold that there? It takes confidence to tighten clamps around a glass vase. But the pieces must not fall outwards either. This used to work when I was a schoolboy. I'm going to put it into solvents. But having now encased it completely, I can't see the vase at all. One of the solvents that I may have to use reacts with shellac, causes a very violent move stain. If it were to stain and get into that white uh, glass, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to remove. So I'm going to cut holes in the paper so that I can see the joins and see whether this stain occurs. If it does, I can remove it from its solvent and neutralize it so it doesn't do any damage. Right, steady this down. Cause it... That's it. We want clamps. Good. All clear? Safely bandaged up inside a detonator, on the 5th of August, the Portland vase begins its last journey in one piece, or nearly so, since the water had already begun its work on the old glue. Okay. Good. Stronger solvents are added to break down the adhesives used to shore up the vase in 1948. It is then left for three days hopefully to achieve what once happened in three seconds. Now, Denise, take that. Great. Three 
days later. Ah, oh, look, that handle's moved. Oh, we must take that handle off. <clears throat> okay, look, you can see it. Yeah. Um, if I just release that, perhaps I can lift that off. Ah. There you go. Number one. It's all yours. I'm going to try and lift it out now. There it comes. Lower it down. Good. Oh boy. Ah, look. There it comes. First one's always the most difficult, you know. Now is the time to start counting. Come on. Come on. There she comes. Ah. I should have been a dentist. <laughs> so it's a really big piece coming now. It's a big piece. Ah. Excellent. Gotta expose the shoulder now. That's a nice one. Slowly, unhurriedly, the pieces mount up. And then I've got a really big bit here. There she comes. I'm going to pull half the, half the side away with this one, I think. How many is that? 120. 120. I think this is the first base. Hooray! Base. There you go. It's small wonder that every fragment survived from the sweeping up of the vase and showcase in 1845. All right. There she goes. There you go, it's the last piece. Whew. Oh boy. <laughs> 187 pieces, not 200 as thought. Enough to keep Nigel busy for the next six months. As well as having the bars in 187 pieces, it can be analysed without having to break it. The research laboratory's X-ray can reveal the cobalt colorant of the blue glass in its exact quantities. Even smaller fragments from the scanning electron microscope give greater insight into Roman technology. Blowing Roman information. Here, magnified over a thousand times from a millimeter of the vase, is the interface between the blue and the white glass. The bubble is air trapped in the glass at the time of making. The oval shape indicates something about the actions of the Roman glass blower, but what? A closer analysis is best done by a practicing glass blower. Bill Goodenrath of New York was consulted by David Whitehouse. Bill, if you look at a piece from the shop, Vase, the glass really is rather thick. Yes. If you come further down it, look at the lower part of the side, it's really very much thinner. And it mm. occurs to me that mm. maybe this is telling us something about that very difficult question mm. how was it made? Was it made yeah, by casting right. or blowing? It's telling a lot, <laughs> is what it's telling. Yeah. Um, it 
it gets thinner to the bottom, thickest at the top, thinnest at the bottom. Very characteristic of blown glass vessels. It shows none of the signs of casting, which would include probably their uniform wall thickness. Is there anything else that looking at these fragments tells us about mm -hmm. how it was made? Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty clear to me that a rather thick, elongated bubble of blue glass was formed. And then it was dipped in a pot of white glass. Uh, and if you look at the piece, clearly it wasn't dipped in all the way up to the uh, neck, up to the top, because you see that the lower handle attachment point shows that the handle was put down on white glass. That's right. It clear as clear as well. Onto Ab the white glass. Absolutely yeah. right. Now, if yeah. you look at the upper attachment point, um, this piece, you see that the handle was put down glass. So it may the, the the white only went up to so far, uh, fairly near the neck. And that would have been that technique of, of dipping glass. I'd like to try that at the furnace. At the New York Glass Workshop, Bill Gooden, with 25 years experience, recreates a 2,000-year-old experience. take three gathers, an initial gather to coat the pipe, a second gather, a little bit more glass, and I blow a bubble. And then I coat that with a very generous amount of glass. The mass on the end of the blowpipe is quite substantial, and I found that to be very awkward. A large mass of soft glass reacts much more strongly to the pull of gravity than a small mass, and you have to work much, much harder with much greater to overcome that effect. We're talking of a very awkward mass of glass which is just dying to hit the floor, drip off the blowpipe. This is the part. The coating of the blue glass by one swift, dexterous immersion in a separate pot of white. Whoever advised craftsman and a great experimenter. I think there must have been a tremendous amount of experimentation. It might have taken place in a concentrated amount of time, but one doesn't leap from the simple thin blown glass objects to the Portland Bays and so forth. You don't make that leap suddenly. It's a tremendous advance in technique. The requirements are simple. Two pipes and a piece of wood. The tool will be simpler than I thought when I began this project. I had the intention of being as authentic as possible. And that meant using the very simplest tools. Tools which would have been present at the time. I went to the British Museum, looked around it, uh, and the Metropolitan Museum, and looked around all the Roman implements of the uh, century BC, first century just to get a feel for what was possible. What would have been harder would have been keeping a force over two degrees. And the vase would have been made by more than one worker. What I aimed for was simplicity. Uh, I've called it often simple glass blowing, not to be confused with primitive glass blowing, but simple glass blowing. So it's only required, minimally required, to make the piece.
The black glass must be annealed. Annealing is the slow cooling of a finished glass vessel. It's going to allow the thin portions to cool at the same rate, that is to change size at the same rate and not crack apart. In the case of the portal vase, the two critical elements are the handles, which easily pop off, and the color of the white and the blue glass would be easy for those to separate with poor annealing. In just 18 minutes, a blank Portland vase, distorted at the neck just like the original. I've worked on the Portland vase for about three months now, part-time. The best I could do yesterday was this. <laughs> Doesn't look exactly like the Portland, um, but this is as far as I've gotten. The person who made the Portland vase, first of all, didn't start with this piece. It's a very tricky, tricky piece. I would have assumed that pieces this fast blowing would have been simpler. With with all of my 16th and 17th century technique, it's been an extremely difficult piece for me and uh, very humbling, very humbling, the whole project. I look at the glass with a whole new uh, perspective now. Up to the speed of the hot glass work comes the patient skill of the cold glass artist. What takes the one minutes takes the other years. It is then that the whole operation is at greatest risk, as has been proved. In the 1870s, there was a competition. A prize of a thousand pounds was offered to the first glass maker who could produce a replica of the Portland Bard using traditional techniques. In 1873, John North took up this challenge. And here it is. In its turn, this too was a sensation. Norwood had worked on his Portland vase for three years, and the result was a triumph. But at the same time, it was almost a catastrophe. The vase was finished. It was being cleaned, and suddenly, spontaneously, it cracked. Stresses in the interior of the glass that Northwood and his team knew nothing about had caused the vessel almost to self-destruct. Somehow, the Roman glassmakers knew a little bit more than their Victorian successors. And the Portland vase, technically, is a far greater triumph than John Northwood of 2000 years later. What we've got to do now is put it together. We've got to look at every fragment and see which one fits to its mate best. If you look, there are two halves to this vase. This one which has all the bits in it. And this half is a mass of tiny little bits. Normally, the process would be to pick up the big bits and stick the big bits, and you build everything up from the big bits. But on this side, of course, I don't have big bits. Mm -hmm. So I've got to manufacture them. And we're going to try and stick little bits together to make bigger ones so that we can build up the whole thing round. That's n not the way to do things. If anybody said to me, well, that's the way I'm going to do it, I'd probably say to them, well, you're a madman. Because <laughs> that's against all the rules. It really can get you into trouble because you are relying on your little joints being accurate. If they're not accurate, then when you come to, them to the big bits, uh, they'll throw everything out. And the only thing then would be to go back and take it to bits again. <laughs> and I don't want to have to do that. <laughs> By November, the washed clean fragments are ready for a trial run with sellotape. It allows a rough order of battle called a sticking list to be drawn up before a single real joint is made. Two, one, four, three. One, four, three. Okay, should we do the first one? Ready? I think we'll do a big one just to get the procedure set down. Um, let's have the UV dot around about there. If we 
keep the UVs in the blue. This time the plan is to use two adhesives. The first dries slowly over seven days, allowing room for adjustment. The second, a tiny tack of resin glue applied to a fixed point, can lock the joint instantly at will and stop slipping. Fingers crossed. Just pressure. Uh, I hate doing that. Ah, good. Let's check me, check me alignment. Okay, that's that looks alright. Okay, let's stick it. That second adhesive is adjustable until set permanently by a 30 second burst of ultraviolet light. Any subsequent restorer will need to know just where the tack is. Hence the red dots. One down, 199 to go. <laughs> Oh, if I do that, I can't get that one at all. <clears throat> won't slip in. So, little one first. There it goes. That one. Just drop that down. Drop the body down. So that one first. Set the heads next. Slowly, little bits become bigger bits. Now I'm attempting to put that body on there. Mm -hmm. There you go. What about the head? Go and try the head. Fine, okay. I think we would stick that. <laughs> Got so many dots there, you know which way you're sticking <laughs> The acid test, you know. <laughs> These two go together. There's no better check of alignment than a fingernail. What's that feel like? They feel good. Well, that's but some bits need optical assistance. One advantage John Doubleday did not have, nor the delicacy of vacuum tweezers. That's it. Well done. OK, let's try this, this one to the big bit now. That goes nicely. Let's try and get his head. Go ahead. See, not, has, see the way it has to move move away before it will slot in? Good job I didn't fit that. That's the one who got that in. Uh, good, let's get that together. Larger pieces become even larger by the 12th of December. Nice. Okay. I think we can stick that. Mm -hmm. So let's get that one in there. But don't crunch it. Can I have a piece of tape across there? You realise what we've done? We've joined the other end. <laughs> Is it in place? Is it in line? It ain't too bad. OK, let's cure it. There's something wrong there. Look, see, it's up there, and this one's there. And yet this, that, this tree looks fine. It's way out there, look. Actually, even, even though you've got that, that, that front leg's been pushed forward to make up that little back. We'll just have to look at it under a microscope to see what's missing. It's going so well. By the 15th of December, the body of the cars is recognisable. But as the shoulder appears, so do the problems. Try this one now. Got it? Mm -hmm. Good. Coming up like that. Yeah. 
but it's not right. <laughs> It's obviously some going on here. Let's have a look at this under the mic, see whether it's right or not. But you know that hand is out. It's just a fraction out along there. That's causing that head to be thrown out a bit as well. I think we're gonna have to take this to pieces. <sighs> my eyes overtaking my brain, you know. <clears throat> the decision to use adjustable adhesives was correct. Parts of the vase will be reconstructed several times before they're right. By December the 22nd, the neck and Christmas are approaching, and so are more difficulties. Well, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the handle off because I know the handle is fine. It's coming. as we move round the other side. This is what worries me. I mean, at this this stage, we're sort of sticking, it's like sticking in midair, because I've got nothing to give me the gauge of, these, of the alignment of that joint, because the surface is missing, the joint is missing, the glass between these two is missing. I can learn to hate this thing. <clears throat> Come on. I swear it me, come on. The problem is, I can't get the neck in. And it's all because of a small misalignment down here. It's only a millimetre. But it's preventing the neck from dropping in properly. What I've got to do is to move this piece just a fraction that way. Luckily, along this line, I haven't stuck it yet. And it allows me to do that. It's a little trick of the trade. <laughs> Nigel was soon to discover that someone else had used some tricks of the trade, too. The problems start when we come up over the shoulder. The previous restorer had exactly the same problem. Whereas I'm trying to get it to go exactly as it wants to go, he tended to make it go as he wanted it to go. So he worked these fragments. Now when I come to stick the fragments, they don't fit properly. And I'm not absolutely sure where they, where they go. The precise positioning is lost. That's a problem. By the new year, most of the problems are over. Structurally, at least, the vase was in one piece, as near as humanly possible in the form its maker originally achieved. But the job is far from over. The figures stand in their original relationships, awaiting the filling of the many missing pieces. In New York State, David Whitehouse considers other gaps in the story. Ever since the port of vase was discovered, scholars have puzzled over what it means, because it's quite clear that these very distinctive features on the vase mean something. One of the first people to speculate about it was the painter Rubens. He came up with an answer that satisfied him, but it didn't satisfy anyone else. And for 350 years after that, some 40 scholars have advanced 40 explanations, and obviously we are going to hear more as time goes by. Painter and Whitehouse believe that the two scenes, though separate, are interrelated. Indeed, they represent a subtle piece of Roman political propaganda. On this, Augustus's claim to divine parentage is mythologically represented. Divine sanction for the golden age of Rome under its first emperor, Augustus. The matching composition of three figures on the reverse of the vase they interpret as the principles in the legend of the judgment of Paris. That final decision which led to the abduction of Helen of Troy, the Trojan War, and the destruction of that great city. 
If I'm right in thinking that this side of the vase, with its ruined architecture and its dying tree, represents the destruction of the city of Troy, and that the other side, with its intact building and its healthy young sapling, represents the rise of Rome, I'm left with the problem of relating those two events. They seem unconnected to us, but to the ancient Romans, the connection would have been very easy to make. For Augustus and his circle, for the poet Virgil, the story is very simple. Without the fall of Troy, Rome would never have existed. And without the rise of Rome, the new golden age of Augustus that Virgil and the Portland vase are celebrating simply wouldn't have happened. And it seems to me, taking all of these things into account, there can be only one original owner of the vase. It was made just as the Aeneid was composed to honor Augustus. And it seems to me that the first owner of the Portland vase, almost beyond doubt, was the first Roman emperor, Augustus himself. Several weeks later, the resins having hardened, the final stages of conservation could begin. Perhaps raising the most difficult question for a conservator, what was its original state? What I've got to do now is to replace some of the missing pieces. But luckily I've got the tacit copy which was made in the 18th century before this was broken, which will tell me exactly how they go. Some pieces, however, are irretrievably lost and must be recreated. The holes are temporarily backed with heated dental wax to hold the filler. That filler must match the original color exactly and must not fade. This resin, tested in the Arizona sun for six months, should prove equal to a hundred years in the British Museum. As the fine touches are applied, other questions. How to minimize the effects of that disastrous encounter with the drunken student, whilst restoring some of its original beauty? How much of the original artistry to enhance without losing a genuine feeling of antiquity? The conservator's skill is to achieve that delicate balance. But the intention of the restorer is to demonstrate the skill of the original creation, achieved without any modern technical aids to hand or eye. To enable to see only what the original artist created, a work of individual genius which has inspired generations as a wonder of human creativity. After nine months of intensive work, the Portland vase is ready to face a new episode in its tooth history, but without losing all the signs of its adventurous past. inspiration to make the vase as an imitation stone cameo. So here in front of us we have the Tazza Farnese, one of the most stunning stone cameos ever carved. Carved sometime not very long after 50 BC to judge by the style. And so there is some very real link, isn't there, between the Tazza Farnese and the Portland vase? Yes. Here in the middle we've got Isis, the Egyptian god 
who's the main subject of the whole scene, but she's not just a goddess. She's sitting on a sphinx, which is the Egyptian symbol of royalty. And that means that we've got an Egyptian queen dressed up as Isis. Now, after 50 BC, there's one really big occasion when that happened. Mark Antony came back from conquering the whole of the Middle East, and they had the most enormous triumph, and Cleopatra dressed up as Isis for that celebration in 34 BC, and that is what is celebrated here on the vase. So a propaganda piece like this was a direct ancestor of the Portland vase, but in fact, we can link this particular piece with the vase, can't we? Well, it, exactly so, and I think that's exactly what it did, because we know from the historians that Augustus, after the Battle of Act, I mean, 31, just three years after this, went to the palace of Cleopatra, walked through the palace, fabulous riches that anybody would have wanted to take away. He took away only one thing. It was a vase made of semi-precious stone. And I'm convinced this is the vase that he took away because it, it had special significance. It symbolized what Mark, Antony, and Cleopatra were, were trying to do to rule the world, which was his own ambition. He took it away, and what does he do? He produces his own propaganda to reply to this, the book and vote itself. But how does Williams view his creation? Well, having worked on it for nearly nine months, I have to ask people what it looks like. I've loved it, I've hated it, um, I've sworn at it, I don't see it. And anyway, I don't know I'm ever happy with anything I do. But it's, it's okay. Yeah, okay. I'm happy with it. Would you like to do it again? Oh, never. No, no. Ruined my Christmas, this thing. Totally ruined my Christmas. <laughs> Portland vase will be back on display at the British Museum from tomorrow. The nine o'clock